All right, welcome to Quick Show. In this episode, we're going to cover a portion of the nomination hearing for Judge Brown Jackson. And this is where Ted Cruz starts talking a little bit about the 1619 Project, critical race theory. It's just a very interesting um, manifestation of how critical race theory has entered into the culture. And it's an interesting stage to kind of go over this. Here you have someone who has a legal background. Obviously, actually, both of them do. Both went to Harvard Law. Uh, They're talking about critical race theory, which is where uh, CRT originated, right, through critical legal studies with uh, Bell and Crenshaw and, and others that were around them. And so let's just take a quick look here at what happens. Ted Cruz is going to start with Martin Luther King. And I think this is a smart way to go. I talk a lot about this. Listen to what he has to say. When Senator Grassley questioned you earlier, he asked in particular about Dr. King's speech uh, on, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where he said most critically, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Do you agree with what Dr. King said? Big question. Speech there? I do, Senator. Okay. We were- okay. The reason this is important is because, uh, again, there are two lines of thought that are going through um, the culture here in the culture war. One is the side of Martin Luther King. It is liberal democracy. It is civil rights. Critical race theory is not civil rights. Not, not in the traditional sense that we look at civil rights. It'll be brought in a little bit. Sometimes, again, when, when it seems to help an argument on the, on the CRT side, it's brought in. But for the most part, civil rights is not a part of CRT. So don't make that mistake when you hear that. Don't just accept that. Martin Luther King represents civil rights. Martin Luther King represents the idea of assimilation to the Constitution, a universal law in the Constitution. This is, this is a major problem for critical race theory. They are completely against this. They do not believe in a constitutional universal law. Right? They don't give support to the Constitution of the United States. That's important to understand. And when I say they, I'm talking about those that have developed critical race theory and the primary pundits and pushers of critical race theory. There is obviously a spectrum that we find of critical race theory that goes from the hardcore creators and, and radicals of critical race theory, plenty of them, and then it kind of moves out, right? Out, we can think of it as additional concentric circles. And the further away you get out, you kind of get into more a little bit about, you know, things that kind of line up a little bit more with Martin Luther King and, and with civil rights. A lot of people, that, that's why there's such a, a difficulty in nailing down, do, do I follow critical race theory? Should I follow critical race theory? So-and-so follows critical race theory. They said they agree with it. What does that really mean? Do they even know what it is? And, and, and that's an important issue here. So Ted Cruz does bring up a very important point, and he's setting the stage for something by saying, do you agree with traditional civil rights here in the United States? Do you believe that we should not be judged by the color of our skin? That is not, that is the antithesis of critical race theory. Critical race theory is everything about the color of your skin. Now, he's going to go on here with something we, some people mistake for what a definition of critical race theory. He's not going to make the mistake, but he's pulling the element in. And that is history. A lot of people, especially on the school side, right, K to 12, think that critical race theory you know, is a matter of changing history or what you, you focus on in history. It is a part of what has become a movement that is critical race theory, part of the critical social justice hydra, right? So it is a part of that, but it is only a, a slice of what critical race theory is. So that's an important distingu- distinguisher to 
to understand that that is just a piece of the of, of critical race theory. But he's going to bring that up by repre- by by referring to the 1619 project. Uh, and in particular, in that speech, you reference the work of quote acclaimed investigative journalist Nicole Hannah Jones. And her, and again, this is a quote from the, the, the founder of the 1619 Project with the New York Times. America was born in uh, th- that, that the um, provocative thesis that the America that was born in 1776 was not the perfect union that it purported to be. And indeed, Miss Hannah Jones in her 1619 Projects describes the central thesis of the 1619 Project. This is key. The New York Times laid out as a revisionist look of history, revising American history. And Ms. Hannah Jones described her central thesis as, quote, one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Okay, now, this is how history becomes a part of critical race theory, because critical race theory, by, by undermining the Constitution, we've already brought that up, it also undermines the founding of the United States. Why? Because the founding of the United States is the primary reason is because it's found on liberal democracy and, and its tenets, right, of freedom, capitalism, etc. This is not what critical race theory is about. Critical race theory is very centered on Marxian tenets. And so it's going to attack the founding of America. Well, one of the ways it does that is by using race. And by going back with Nicole Hannah-Jones, what she does with the 1619 Project to say, in essence, and they've had to revise this and take some of these, these words down, but this is what the 1619 Project is, is they say, look, 1776 is not the founding of America. And they, they are trying to change the understanding of that in the culture, in history, to the fact that the America was founded in 1619. That's the first time that African slaves were brought across the transatlantic in the transatlantic tr- slave trade by ship, right? So the founding of America is built directly on slavery. And see if they can move it to that understanding that all of America is built not off of these freedom principles of 1776, but off of slavery in 1619. That's then they then they can undermine the founding of America, liberal democracy. That's what the push is. And if you think that's not it, I, I, I would I would challenge you to take a look at what six, the 1619 project has said and look up what it did say before it had to pull some things down. This is found with the New York Times. They have their own website on this. This, this is not This is not a bogeyman, right? A right-wing bogeyman. This is exactly what the 1619 Project tries to do. So it's a little concerning that the judge here, Judge Brown Jackson, is referring to that in a speech. Now, I will say, as I've listened to her and gone through the uh, uh, much of the hearings, I I I don't know if she's a radical. Possibly, Uh, some of her background and decisions are a little things that I would disagree with. But that's a little bit of a red flag. Now, we're going to find that with a lot of people on the left, right? And it might be people that are not really supportive of fully critical race theory. Again, they're on the spectrum somewhere. I don't know exactly where Judge Brown Jackson is on the spectrum of of critical race theory. It's very hard to know that, uh, even with certain decisions and what was entailed in that. We're going to find out a little bit more once she's approved and gets on the bench on the Supreme Court and and makes some of her decisions. But critical race theory is not just about history. That is a small part of what critical race theory is. Now let's keep going with uh, Ted Cruz on this. Do you agree with Ms. Hannah Jones that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence is because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery? Thank you, Senator. This when is interesting. I gave that speech at the University of Michigan. I was asked to speak on Martin Luther King Day. And um, every year they have a Martin Luther King Day speaker. And okay. I gave a speech about black women in the civil rights movement. Um, okay, so she's tying this into the civil rights movement, right? 
And that's, that's, people don't know. I don't, I honestly don't think she knows. I, I might be wrong. She may just be playing this completely. These, these nominees on the left and the right are very, very well trained before they get put before the Senate in these hearings and, and everything from their tone, their look, their facial expressions. It's all an act, you know, to some degree with everybody left and right. Right, it's you've got the attorneys that are surrounding them, telling them how to answer these things, what words not to say, all of this. So, so it's really hard to tell in these circumstances. This is, this is for show on both sides mostly, but it doesn't surprise me, even if she's not fully invested in critical race theory, that she would refer to the 1619 project in a civil rights. Uh, topic in a civil rights speech. And you can see how dangerous that is. Martin Luther King is not go- is, is, is what he, he is an icon in a sense of liberal democracy and civil rights, not of the founding of America on slavery in 1619. He is an icon of the Constitution, that we're all to be judged equal under the same law. His issue is America has the right ideals, but it doesn't live up to them. That's very different from what critical race theory, which is a radical revamping of the entire culture, of the entire form of government and of history and and of liberal democracy as a whole. But you can see how these things start getting conflated really easily. Uh, One slide was of... Ms. Uh, a journalist, as you say, who, who made that statement, and I called it provocative. Um, it is not something that I've studied. It doesn't come up in my work. I was mentioning it because it was Which, used at that time. Irresponsible. Talked about. It's irresponsible. Well known. 1619 Project is closely, closely intertwined with a movement that is called critical race theory. Okay. I'm going to stop that right there. When he says movement, that's what you need to understand. This is another another thing that, again, when you talk about what critical race theory is, many of them are going to say a movement. You can't say it's a movement. It's a theory taught in, in legal, a legal theory. And in fact, Judge Brown Jackson is going to say, say the same thing here in a bit. That is not true. That is not true. What he said here is right. It is a movement. The founders of critical race theory say that it is a movement, right? It is about praxis, which is how you get out and be active with critical race theory. It's about activism. It is about conversion. Going with Ibram Kendi, it's about converting to being an anti-racist, which is not saying I'm not a racist. It's saying I'm a hard left radical activist. That's what it is. So it is a movement. And in the words, in their own words, from critical race theorists, the developers and the pundits of critical race theory, it is a movement. It is an ideology. Critical race theory, as you know, originated at your and my alma mater at the, at the Harvard Law School. Uh, in your understanding, what, what does critical race theory mean? What is it? Big question. Senator, my understanding is that critical race theory is um, it is an academic theory mm-hmm. that is about the ways in which uh, race interacts with um, various institutions. Systems. It doesn't come up in my work as a judge. It's never something that I've uh, studied or relied on, and it wouldn't be something that I would rely on if I was on the Supreme Court. Okay, so... Uh I, I have a little bit of a hard time believing this. She went to Harvard Law and she didn't study critical race theory uh, at all. She's a black woman going to Harvard Law and she was never in a class and she leans left and there's is is there that she was never in a class that researched and studied critical race theory. That's that's a little bit difficult to understand. But what's more important to me here is that she says critical race theory is a legal theory. False. This is absolutely false. It is a, in fact, it has become a very tiny part of what critical race theory is. I had an argument with this is with a, 
a BYU graduate professor, PhD, in the humanities online about critical race theory and what it was. And this professor says the same thing. I'm right, right? How can you say these things? You must be embarrassed, Greg, that you're saying all these things about critical race theory. And that this is, this is simply a legal theory founded in law that, that that's all it is. Okay, no, it is not all it is. And in fact, it's not ever all that it was. It was applied first to, to, uh, to, to the law, right, to, to legal theory. But you have to see where it comes from. And, and, and again, the, the founders are, are, are moving around Martin Luther King and going back and they're pulling from, from icons and, and um, figures such as Angela Davis, the radical Angela Davis. They're pulling from Marcusa, her mentor, Mar- uh, Davis's mentor, Marcusa, who is a Marxist and part of the Frankfurt School. They're pulling from critical theory from the Frankfurt School. That's how you get the name critical race theory. So it is not just a theory. That's kind of like saying that Marxism is just a theory. It's a political theory. It's an economic theory. No, it is not. When put in place, it demands activation. It demands change. It demands a movement. It is an ideology. It is a worldview. So even in the beginning, you can't just say it is a legal theory. It pulls from radical feminism right from the beginning with Kimberly Crenshaw also and Angela Davis. It pulls from postmodernism also very firmly, and that has to do with truth. And and so it's not not something that, that is built just for the law. It never was. It has to do with culture. It has to do with literature. It has to do with race. It has to do with liberal democracy. It has to do with philosophy going back you know, centuries. So this is another place, just like I talked about history, it is another place where where people get caught up thinking that this is what critical race theory is. It's a legal theory. Again, in their own words, they discredit this. This is not what it is. They know that it is something else. It was built to be something else. So if someone argues with you and says, this is critical, critical race theory is just a legal theory, right? You know it's wrong. It's flat out wrong. The reason, and then they'll come back and give supporting evidence that it was founded in, at Harvard Law, with, in, in law, et cetera. You know, whatever. It could have been founded anywhere. Where it was founded in, really, is just an application of a number of different tenets in postmodernism, radical feminism, and, and critical theory you know, built on Marxism. All three of those are built on Marxism. All right, let's keep going here. Critical race theory, as you know, has its origins in the critical legal studies movement, which also came from Harvard Law School, from a number of critical legal studies professors, crits as they were known when we were in law school. The crits. uh, Who are explicitly Marxists. Mm -hmm. And we find their origins in Marxism, although critical legal studies frames society as a fundamental battle between socioeconomic classes. Critical race theory frames all of society as a fundamental and intractable battle uh, between between the races. It views every conflict as, as a racial conflict. Okay, here's something I want to say on this. This is true also, but it's not completely true. When you're talking about... Um, critical race theory, it, it, it has become much more than that. Originally, that was more its design, but because of the ingredients that have been brought into this, especially the radical feminism, uh, and, I, and I cannot stress enough how influential, and when I mean radical feminism, I mean angles, right, of Marx and Engels. I mean radical, radical feminism. I'm not talking about equality of opportunity for women. 
right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about break down the family. I'm talking about oppression. You know, this is this is something very different, right? Again, a spectrum uh, on, on, on the feminist side. But critical race theory really moved well beyond that very, very quickly outside of race. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term critical race theory, also later coins the term intersectionality. All intersectionality is, is an application of critical race theory to other segments uh, in society outside of race. That's, that's what it basically is. If I was to summarize it as shortly as I could, that's what you're looking at. So sexual orientation, um, disabilities, citizenship, education, race, you know, a lot of different elements here that could be pulled in and intersection, intersectionality ba- basically says, okay, I'm, I'm a racial minority. I'm a sexual orientation minority. I, I can bring those two together. And I actually, that, that, that intersection there of those two things puts me in yet a, an even tougher category an even more oppressed category that has experiences from both of those backgrounds. So critical race theory is used and really is basically the same thing as intersectionality. Um, but I've never studied critical race theory and mm. I've never used it. It doesn't come up in the work that I do as a judge. So, so with respect, I, hope that's I, I true. find that a curious <laughs> statement uh, because um, you gave a speech in April of 2015 uh, at the University of Chicago in which you described the job you do as a judge and you said sentencing okay, is pay attention. interesting because it melds together myriad types of law, criminal law, and of course constitutional law, critical race theory. So you described in a speech to a law school what you were doing as critical race theory. Okay, so again, this could be a similar circumstance that she had before. Is she just pulling this in because it's a popular thing to talk about? Or is she invested in this? It, it, where is she on the spectrum? I, I don't know. But again, this is a very good little example here in, in this little lab here that we have in the hearing of, of understanding this spectrum of critical race theory, what it is and what it isn't. If she's not invested in critical race theory and, and it's not a part of the sentencing in her past, why is she adding this in here? Does she feel she needs to? Is she going to get more pats on the back for this? like getting more likes on social media. Why is she saying this? Either way, it's concerning. And, and it's a red flag. Uh, and so I guess I would ask, what, what did you mean by that when you gave that speech? With respect, Senator, um, the quote that you are mentioning there um, was about sentencing policy. It was not about sentencing. Um, okay. I think that's a really weak answer there. Um, there could be a little bit of kernel of truth in there that she's talking about, but it's a very weak answer. And, and it, it makes me a little bit concerned about her background on this. Now, it's not surprising that someone here is, is, that is leaning left is, has got a background in critical race theory. Uh, that's just not surprising at all. As you may recall, during the confirmation hearings of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, there was a great deal of attention paid to the fact that Justice Barrett served as a board member on the board of trustees of a religious private school and and the press focused very intensely on the views of that school in your questionnaire to this committee you disclose that you are similarly on a board specifically the board of trustees for the georgetown day school and that you've been a board member since 2019 and you're currently still a board member apparently a far left school that is correct uh in regard to the georgetown day school you've publicly said Quote, since becoming a member of the GDS community seven years ago, Patrick and I have witnessed the transformative power of a rigorous progressive education that is dedicated to fostering critical thinking, interdependence, and social justice. Mm -hmm. So, Judge Jackson, all of us will agree that, that no one should be discriminated against because of race. When you just testified a minute ago that you didn't know if critical race theory was taught in K through 12, mm. I will confess I, I, I find that statement a, a little hard to reconcile. I, I don't believe it for uh, a second. Public record, because if you look at the Georgetown Day School's curriculum, it is filled and overflowing with critical race theory. 
that that among the doc and this is all true okay so the the when you go through this um and, and you go through the hearing i mean i know she's really polished seems like a very nice lovely woman uh and 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 bright and and qualified i think that everything that you would say where she's qualified she's going to check all the boxes for being a supreme court justice but make no mistake i mean this background and where she's at this is this is very much, it's not like I'm liberal leaning. You know, again, get that out of your head. Stop thinking liberal is all le- all on the left. That's not what it is, right? Le- liberal, let's just call liberal now today is now left leaning. It's center left in our world today. This what, what she is talking about here and the words that she's bringing up and the organizations she's involved with are hard left. So is that just because she's kind of in that area? How invested is she in those things? You know, again, I don't know. I'm not going to say whether or not uh, this isn't about whether she's going to be a good Supreme Court justice or not. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, is, is you can see as she brings these things up and the more of these red flags come up about social justice and, and, and critical race theory and other things like that, you can see that this is, it's everywhere is my point. Right, whether she's fully invested and converted to all of these things or not, I don't know, but it is everywhere, and so she's going to repeat these things at a minimum, even if she's not pushing it. But she's on a board that of a school, a private school that definitely pushes critical race theory. When you see the types of books that are available and part of the curriculum there, now what Senator Cruz here is going to do, he's going to go through several of the books I've read. Perhaps all, I think all of the books he's going to talk about, I know what they say, I know what they are. It is indoctrination. It, it, it's, it's full indoctrination on Marxian tenets and, and critical race theory. Um, but going back to the K-12 thing, th- th- it's ridiculous that people say that it's not taught. And I'm doing an episode here shortly, uh, probably next week, on Kimberly Crenshaw and what she's beginning to say about the movement against critical race theory, the backlash in, in, in critical race theory in the United States. Very interesting what, what she says. It is everywhere in the curriculum and being pushed everywhere in K-12, to I promise you. Those of you we have got, obviously, a, a, a decent following in Utah, it's coming, and it's coming like a storm into K-12, to especially with your governor, who is uh, very willing to allow that stuff to come in. It, it's, I, I think in Utah, you're going to see a massive push toward homeschooling and charter schools. I think it's going to happen everywhere in the United States. I, I, I think we are barely scratching the surface as to how strongly this is going to get put in and, and pushed in the public education system. Okay, this is Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram Kendi. I've talked about that before. To be racist or anti-racist, there is no new. It's disgusting. Another portion of the book. They recommend the babies confess. Get to them early. When being racist. Confessed for the babies. This is a book that is taught at Georgetown Day School to students in pre-K through second grade. So four. But here's the important question, and she actually does a very good um, job. Do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator. Think. Think about it. I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. I don't believe in any of that. Okay, so she's going to go into something completely different that is completely irrelevant to what we're talking about here. But um, again, that's the right answer, obviously. The problem is, is then you take that question to the next step. All right, Cruz asks uh, the judge, is, do you believe that, that, uh, that, that babies could be racist? That they are, they they should confess that they're racist. Um, She gives the right answer. No, nobody, no baby should, or no child, she says, should may, be made to feel that way, that they are oppressors or anything else. Well, that's anti-critical race theory. So we'll see how she does mo- moving forward on this. That is completely anti-critical race theory that is coming into the schools for the children. 
Number two, though, take that one step further. Okay, what about what about a teenager? We're say, saying child. Does that include a teenager in high school? Should teenagers be feel that they are racist and and that they are oppressors automatically because of their skin color? That's critical race theory. That's taught already in a lot of classes. Uh, and then take it another step. What about adults? If kids shouldn't feel that way, children shouldn't feel that way, should, should adults feel that way regardless of their behavior? Are they, are they automatically racist because of their skin color? Should they feel automatically like they are oppressors? See, that's what the movement wants to eventually accomplish. And then they want to tie the solution in, the solution to a hard left solution with Marxian tenets. And if you can do that, then you overthrow liberal democracy, you overthrow capitalism. And I know this sounds way out there and it sounds, you know, uh, conspiracy theory and everything else. Trust me, this is exactly what they talk about. This is this is not some, let me make this up in, 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 my, in my conjecture here of where this is going to go. No, this is where the founders of critical race theory say they are taking us. This is where the pundits... This is where Ibram Kendi and Robin DiAngelo and Kimberly Crenshaw and Angela Davis and Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk and all the others, right? They all say the same thing. They are all in the same boat, right? Where they are, which is, which is a, or, or a car that has the chassis of Marxian tenets that's going to move us from point A to point B. It's all the same thing. So I think that this little lab here that we get. This is a very interesting place, again, where we have a, an exposure of critical race theory, a discussion. Thank goodness Senator Cruz brought this up. I don't always agree with Senator Cruz, um, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm glad that he or anybody would bring this up in this situation. It needs to be talked about. And, and so when you talk about it and you get shut down as if you're some far right wing nut job, right? You have to keep talking about it. You have to keep talking about it because if we're our heads are in the sand on this, and and we don't know where people are on the spectrum of critical race theory, it's just going to continue to increase. It's going to continue to move into all of the institutions. It's going to continue to change the systems, and it's going to change the country. I hope you took something more out of this episode. Thanks for watching. <laughs>